Maybe we should put on the dance music again. Good morning, Mount Carmel. Good morning. <clears throat> One more time. Good morning, Mount Carmel. Good morning. It's not Mount Carmel. It's MC3. Y'all see that trick you. <laughs> Good morning, MC3. Good morning. There it is. Praise the Lord. Y'all ready to praise God today? Yes. I want to try something a little different this morning. You know how most of the time people say God is good and you say all the time, right? I just want to switch it up a little bit. I want to say God is good and y'all say God is awesome. Can we do that? Yeah. Let me see how that works. God is good. God is awesome. Y'all are not good arguers. Y'all are supposed to, like, <laughs> supposed to try to outdo me. Oh, okay. Okay. God is good. God is awesome. That was not even as good. Come on, one more time. <laughs> I'm going to give you one more time, all right? One more time, all right? One more time. God is good. God, God is awesome. awesome. There we go. We serve an awesome God today, right? Yes. Yes, we do. Come on, we're going to serve him. We're going to serve him as we sing today. Can we do that? Come on, put your hands together. Say it like this. Say, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with his wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Oh, oh. Into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Say, our God is greater. Say. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Come on, let's see Our God is great, <laughs> Yeah, he's worthy to be praised. Come on, put your hands together. Say, into the darkness, say, into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, there's none like you. Our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, yeah, our God, our God, our God, our God. Yeah. Yeah. He's greater. And if our God is for us, then. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And what can stand against? Up. Our God is greater, our 
Hey guys, good morning. My name is Will. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, thank you for all being here with us this morning at MC3 Church and coming to worship with us. I've got some announcements for us, and as our guys get ready to uh, move into offering and, and pass the plates back and forth, we've got attendance books, and if you've already filled it out and got your address and everything on it, no need to do that again. Just fill out your name so we know you were here. If you weren't here, if you had, it's your first time here, fill out your address or phone number or whatever you're comfortable with so we can um, get in, 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 in contact with you. Um, also, this Saturday is the Priscilla Shire Conference, um, so, and that's all day, and this is your last week to register. That Saturday, and it starts at 9, at 9 o'clock, um, and that's an all-day thing. It's going to be awesome, um, and it's going to be simulcast here in the Fellowship Hall. We've got uh, breakfast and lunch, and the cost of that is $25, so um, Art has asked everybody to go out and invite one person, so be in charge of getting one person here for that. Um, also, for the student ministry, um, on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, um, we are hosting our student ministry taco dinner fundraiser. It's also going to be a silent auction, so um, you've got two responsibilities to help us out here. Um, one is to invite people here and yourself here and come eat with us and have a good time. And the second, if you have anything you would like to donate a gift, um, just an idea, we've got some like signed sports stuff from players in the NFL or who were in the NFL or played at Georgia. We've also got some people who are going to make some hanging baskets. Um, or, you know, if you're a student, some of our students are going to donate um, three hours of babysitting or um, a cooked dinner or something like that. Um, so anything you can think of is fine. Um, but I'm going to pray for offering for us real quick. And then after, check out what we've got on the screens for some announcements. Lord, thank you just for this time that we get to come together with you um, and give back what you've already given to us. Uh, continue to bless this church, MC3, and just let... Um, our, our tithes, tithes and offerings just, just continue to further ministry here in our community and to uh, continue to further it to the rest of the world. And then we pray. Amen. Amen. And good morning. Welcome to MC3. We are so glad that you're here. As you come in today, we invite you to sit down close. At MC3, we are simply a family that follows Christ and serves His kingdom. And so as you jump into worship today, we invite you to celebrate with your whole heart. Here are some events that we don't want you to miss. Have you started your one-year journal plan reading program? You have it? SOAP, which stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer, are offering bookmarks beginning in April through June. You can pick up your bookmarks at the Connection Counter, and while you're there, consider picking up a journal with a $10 donation. Have you heard about Nothing But The Truth? Well, it provides food items for children who receive lunches during the week but may go hungry on the weekend. MC3 Church is looking for individual containers of fruit cups, applesauce, pop-tarts, and Roman noodles. All donations will be collected at the Connections Counter. We are so glad you decided to join us today, and we can't wait to see you again next week. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> well, let's praise God. Y'all want to praise Him again? Yes. I, I thought y'all did pretty good that time. All right, you did. You did all right. Can, I know you're tired, but can you can you give us a little bit more this time, then? All right, good. That's good. That's, that's all. That's all I need. Just a just a little bit. Y'all know this one, real easy. I want to be close, close to your side. Heaven is real. Death is a lie. I want to hear voices, angels above, singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside me. be near, 
near to your heart, loving the world and hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power. just a little bit and just say thank you lord thank you first of all for loving us first god you you you've shown it to us over and over and over again how much you love us and you continue god to just come after us <laughs> no especially no matter how bad we mess up you're still you're still coming for us and we're just so grateful god for your loving kindness can we just give them a, just a big thank you lord <laughs> Thank you. 
God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Hold me over. Vision can be slippery, hard to define, even resistant to definition. But you know it when you see it. It's a matter of the heart. It's God's given insight into direction and purpose. Every dream started with vision. Every passion has been ignited by it. And every great accomplishment was made possible by this powerful gift. Vision is what keeps us persevering through the tough times and what compels us to travel that extra mile. Jesus had it in spades. His eye was always on his ultimate goal, laying down his life for his friends. I want that kind of vision 
I want to see things that others can't. I want to be standing with a group of people, all of whom are staring at a pile of rocks. And I want to be able to see a marvelous work of art. I think that's what vision is. So, we've been in the middle of a sermon series that we've just kind of titled New Life. We started all the way back at Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and we talked about how the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. I don't know how much you know that or how much you realize that. Maybe you know it here, but maybe here, not so much. But the resurrection of Jesus is a game changer on multiple levels, multiple levels. And so we've been marching through... Ever since Easter Sunday, we've been marching through the book of Acts. And we've been tracking how the resurrection of Jesus, how it changed the early church, and how it changes us as well. And so uh, Easter Sunday, we talked about just a new life that we have in Jesus. It's always great to have a do-over, to be able to do something once again. You ever play kickball when you were kids? And someone would roll the ball and it would bounce or something and you would pick it up and you'd say, do over. And you'd hand it back to the pitcher and you'd get another another pitch coming your way. And so it's good to have a do over. We also talked about the importance that the resurrection gives us a new purpose in life. And we looked at Acts chapter 1 and we looked at the purpose that Jesus gave the early church uh, in Acts chapter 1. Last week we were in Acts chapter 2. And we talked about the new spirit. It's not really a new spirit. It's an old spirit because he's been around before, long before we've been around, but new to us, right? And then we receive that spirit when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That Holy Spirit walks with us, shows us what to do, how to do it, teaches us. And we talked about all those things last week. Today what we're going to discover is that the resurrection of Jesus gives us new vision. It gives us a whole new vision than what we ever thought or could have imagined before. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 10. We're going to kind of fast forward just a little bit, leapfrog into uh, a good part of Acts. Acts chapter 10. If you you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. You can get on the uh, mobile app, uh, YouVersion Bible app. Uh, you can you can download that, and in there, when you get to the events section, you can find uh, MC3 or Mount Carmel Christian Church. Click on that, and you'll have all the notes right there. It'll also be up on the screens behind me. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. So while, while you're turning, let me catch you up to what's taking place in the church uh, since, we've, since we've been uh, studying the book of Acts. Acts 1, Jesus is on the earth for just a little bit, uh, for a few days, and he tells the, the apostles, tells the disciples to wait. Don't do anything. Just wait for the gift that my Father is has, has going to give you, which is the Holy Spirit. And so they wait. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends on them in power. And so they be, begin to, uh, and it's always kind of strange when God sometimes works in our lives. We may have a plan for how God should work, but then God has a different plan that sometimes, quite frankly, is kind of weird to us. It's different, it's strange. But God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. And so, in Acts chapter 2, even Luke struggles to describe what he sees. He says something like, tongues of fire come and rest on the disciples. And so he's, they're trying to figure it all out. But in the midst of it, they begin to speak in other languages. The languages of the people that had been from all parts of of the world to come to Jerusalem to worship on the day of Pentecost. And at that very moment, they begin to hear the word of God. They begin to hear the gospel spoken in their very own language, and it draws attention. And then Peter stands up and begins to preach to the people what they're witnessing. And so the Spirit uh, uh, comes on in power. And that day, 3,000, 3,000 join the church and are baptized into Christ. Then... Then in Acts chapter 4 and 5, we see the the church begins to grow. But somewhere along the way, persecution begins to set in. Stephen, one of the the, uh, the followers of Christ, he's a deacon. Uh, He is is stoned to death for his uh, defense of Jesus Christ by the religious leaders. And Saul of Tarsus, who will later become Paul, stands there uh, in... uh, in agreement with all that's taken place. He's kind of holding all the coats and jackets for everybody 
that's stoning Stephen to death. But this ushers in a time of persecution for the church. And so while the church enjoyed growth and enjoyed all these people coming, now there's persecution and the people begin to scatter to, of all places, a couple different states, Judea and Samaria. So they were in Jerusalem, and it was just a Jerusalem church. But then when persecution came, everybody scatters out to Judea and Samaria, the very places that Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses. He said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And today, we're going to be talking about the beginning of that ends of the earth, because when we get to Acts chapter 10, Most of, uh, there's a few apostles still in Jerusalem, but most everybody else is scattered. In fact, we're going to find the apostle Peter uh, living in a a beach house of a friend at the port that's nearest to Jerusalem, some 30 miles away. So even he left out because of the things, the persecution that came his way. So Acts chapter 10, we're going to start at uh, verse 1, because I want you to uh, see here what happens. We're going to be introduced to a guy named Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile, and a Gentile is anyone who is not Jewish. So if you did not grow up and none of your parents were Jewish, then you are a Gentile, according to the Scripture. So congratulations if you didn't know that already, okay? So Cornelius uh, is, is a Gentile. He's, he's, he's maybe one of us, maybe we might say. So here's what it says in verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed regularly to God. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He said. And the angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who had spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and he sent them to Joppa. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. For those of you who've been... Believers for a long time, or maybe for some, maybe, maybe a short amount of time, or maybe even for some, maybe not at all. But let me ask you a question. Has God ever done anything like this for you? Has God ever done anything like this for you? Maybe, let me ask it a different way. How about this? Has God ever expanded your view of who he is or expanded your vision of what he wants to do in your life? Has he ever done that for you? Well, if not, if you go, listen, I've never had that happen. Never seen an angel, and I'm right there with you. I've never seen one either. Never seen an angel. I've never, I've never, uh, uh, ever really grasped onto the purpose and the vision that God has for my life. I don't know. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Because today we're going to just simply talk through a few things to see if we can't find out how we can expand our view. Of God, And I think there's some key steps that we can take because here's the thing. When we think about serving God, God wants, God wants us to expand our view just beyond going, okay, now I'm a Christian. I guess I just get up on Sundays and come to church and study my Bible and read and pray and check those boxes and go on. There has to be more to life than that. There has to be more to this Christian walk than all of that. If there are 12 guys who are going to follow Jesus and give up everything, there had to be more to what Jesus was offering them than to, hey, we're just going to get together on a Sunday, and we're going to hang out and, uh, and in a little bit, and at noon we're going to get out, and we're going to go eat lunch, and then, then you just go and, and rest and watch football or golf all day. Is that okay? There had to be more as to why these 12 guys would follow, would follow Jesus. You know, it could be that God wants to do something amazing through you, to reach a coworker, someone that you, that, you, that, you, um, that you are around and you go, I don't, I don't know uh, who they are or what they're doing, but they need Jesus. Somebody ought to tell them about Jesus. Well, maybe that someone is you. I love that last song because it reminds us that there are times that we need to leave the 99 in order to go after that one, to reach that one 
in our community that needs Christ. And sometimes we have, to, we have to leave the comfort of what we see and what we know in order to do that. And that just may be that you are the one to do it, that you're the one. Maybe it's, maybe it's someone that you go to school with, someone that you know uh, that, that you have a friendship with and that you could invite to church, and, and yet you haven't. So here's the thing. Here's the, here's the challenge. Will kind of kicked it off. Here's the challenge for Priscilla Shire you're to invite one person, even if you're, even if you're a guy, even if you're a dude, uh, you invite to Priscilla Shire. Now, you won't be here, right? But, but the ladies will, all right? Uh, and so we want you to invite. So as you leave today, we want you to take one of those little flyers, and we want you to invite to Priscilla Shire. That's a Saturday. But here's the next thing. Here's the next. I want you to look to your right and your left. See the seat next to you? Maybe it's filled. Maybe it's not. Uh, here's, here's your job. You are responsible for your seat to your right and to your left. You're responsible. And I want you to be thinking about someone that you're going to invite to come to hear the gospel message, to hear Jesus being preached, to hear Jesus being sung, to hear Jesus, as we, as we think about communion, and hear what he has done for us, you're responsible for the chair to the right and to the left. And if you're on the end, you think, oh, I only got one chair, right? Because I don't have one over here. That's okay. We want to add a chair beside you, right? So... You don't get out. You don't get out of it. Uh, we're, we are challenging you to reach that one person, to reach that one person, and to expand your mind beyond maybe what you had ever thought about who Jesus is and what he wants to do in your life. So this is exactly, it's exactly what God did to Cornelius. But how did it happen? How, how, did, how did God do that? How did he make, how did he show up? As an angel, what, what caused all that to happen? Because God just doesn't show up with an angel to everyone. What were some of the things that Cornelius was doing? What were some of the things that the Apostle Peter was doing in all of this as well? And so we want to kind of recreate, we want to look at this and see if we can't recreate some of this in our own life. Because here's what we see. Here's what we see. Cornelius was praying. He was praying. Uh, to God. In fact, uh, here's what, here's, here's what we, want, we, we need to do when we come before God and pray. You, you may have seen the, the announcement about our prayer time, about uh, uh, getting one of the uh, bookmarks, reading God's word, and getting a journal, and praying, and how important that, this is extremely important. This is more important than this is in so many ways. I want to tell you something, this is more important than this is. This and this are great together. But when we do this, when we sit down with Scripture on our own and we pray and we read, we allow God to begin to teach us and be, begin to pour into us Monday through Saturday. And it helps us even out on Sunday. Makes us, makes us better worshipers. Uh, it makes us better encouragers. Uh, it makes us better prayers. Uh, it makes us uh, uh, better evangelists as we reach our neighbors and our friends. It, it makes us better inviters uh, to invite the people uh, that, that are going to sit on our right and our left. It makes us better because God begins to pour into us. And that's exactly what he did with Cornelius. Here's what we want you to know. In order, in order for us uh, to, uh, to have our vision expanded, in order for God to expand the vision of who we are and what he wants to do in our life, the first thing is this. We need to look for God in prayer. We need to look for God in prayer. It's exactly what Cornelius did. It's interesting because in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 13 and 14, he says something that's extremely powerful because I think sometimes as believers, we just check the box. I'm supposed to pray, so I'll pray. And we pray, but do we, when we pray, do we really I mean, let's be honest with yourself. When you pray sometimes, or when you pray most of the time, are you really expecting God to show up? Are you expecting God to be there? Are you expecting that, there is this, that there's going to be an opportunity for you to meet with God? Or is it a, well, here's my meal, so I'm going to pray for my meal. Or, oh, yeah, I forgot to pray for so-and-so, so I'll just offer that, that prayer up. Do you look for God in prayer? I want you to see what Jeremiah says. Here's what it says. And this is a promise by God. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you underline in your Bible or you highlight or whatever, uh, this is one to highlight. 
that when you seek me with all of your heart, when you seek me with all your heart, are you seeking God with all your heart? Because that's what it really means to look for God in prayer. God, I'm seeking after you. I want to know you. I want to hear from you. I want to be in your presence. That's what it means. Or do we just kind of expect, eh, maybe sometimes God will show up. Now, does this always translate as to one of those mountaintop experiences that we'll always have? In other words, Art, I've tried that before, and I didn't always have a mountaintop experience. I didn't always feel that maybe God was there. But the more and more we begin to look for him, the more and more we begin to search for him, the more and more we go up on the mountain to pray. And the more he meets with us, the more we're going to find that we've been on that mountain with him. And so we need to look for him in prayer. Look at what Cornelius did in this time. In fact, it says he was praying. Look at verse 2 and 3. He says, he gave generously to those that were in need and prayed to God regularly. And at one, at one day, about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. 3 in the afternoon is one of the three set times that, that uh, Jewish people prayed to God. Now, he's a Gentile, but he has fully given himself to the Lord. And so he, it, it, it seems from Scripture that he met all three requirements. That he prayed at the first set prayer time, and the second set prayer time, which is the three in the afternoon, and the third set prayer time. Cornelius was a man of prayer. He was looking for God in prayer. Look at what the Apostle Peter does. Because here you have Cornelius up in Caesarea, about 65 miles away, and then you have the Apostle Peter hanging out at the beach, doing the exact same thing the next day. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 9 through 11. Look at this. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey, as those two servants and that soldier were on their journey to go find the apostle Peter, it says they approached the city. Peter went up on the roof to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open. And something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. So here's the thing. Cornelius' band of men are coming this way to find Peter. Peter's in in Joppa. He goes, he's hungry, waiting on the meal to be prepared, waiting on lunch. He goes up and begins to pray, and he sees this vision of this sheet being let down out of heaven. What were both men doing? They're the same, same. They were praying. If you want to meet with God then it happens in prayer. Look for God in prayer. Look for God in prayer. Number two, number two, look to get the attention of God. Look to get God's attention. So maybe the question is, well, okay, well, how does that happen? How do I get God's attention? How does that take place? Well, look at verse four and look at what Cornelius does. As Cornelius sees this angel and the angel calls his name, and here's Cornelius, he's afraid because he's, there's an angel, and I would be afraid too. I'd be scared, scared uh, 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 definitely. And here's this angel, I want you to hear what the angel says. Because when he calls his name, when the angel calls his name, he says, what is it, Lord? And the angel says in verse 4, he says, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering to God. Did you catch that? Did you catch what took place here? Did you see what... Cornelius was doing, what he was doing day in and day out, that he was praying and he was giving his gifts to the poor, day in and day out, giving and praying, giving and praying, giving and praying, and just, and then all of a sudden, it captures God's attention. Have you ever done anything that has captured God's attention, where God stands up off his throne and goes, are you guys seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Are you seeing, are you watching this? Have you been, he has been in prayer this many days in a row. It's been incredible. Look what they're doing. They're serving in the community. Many of you came this Thursday and you served here while our community came and had a great concert. Some of you guys were out in the parking lot, you know, making sure um, people got in the bright parking spaces, making sure you didn't get run over, that sort of thing. Uh, some of you were in here getting the, 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 uh, the cookies and tea and the coffee all, all set out, and people were greeting and making sure kids got to where they needed to go. See, those are incredible things. God notices those things that we do, that those, those little quiet ways that we serve. And that's what Cornelius was doing. He was quietly serving. He was quietly giving. 
He was quietly praying. And God stands up off the throne and goes, okay, watch this. This is going to be phenomenal. I don't know if you've heard this story before, but one night, about 1130 at night, an older African-American woman uh, was standing by the side of a road. Her, uh, her car had broke down on an Alabama highway, and it was in the middle of this torrential downpour. And here she is in the rain. Her car's broke down. She's in a hurry uh, to get to, to a place, and she didn't know what to do. She was desperate. She was soaking wet, and she, was, she just hoped that she would flag the next car that came by at 1130 at night. And, of course, at 11.30 at night, you never know what you're going to get, right? You never know if it's going to be someone uh, who's going to be good or someone uh, who might, who might uh, 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 steal or do something to you. And so she decided, though, I'm going to flag down the next car because I've got to get on to my destination. And so when the car stopped, it was a young white man who stopped to help. Generally, it was unheard of back in, back in the days of the conflicts in the 1960s. And the man took her to, uh, to safety helped her get assistance, put her in a taxi cab, uh, and sent her uh, on her way. She seemed to be in a real big hurry, so before she left out, she, wrote, she wanted to write down his address. And he just figured just to send a, just to send a note of, of thanks, maybe. And so seven days went by, and this man is at his house, and a knock comes at the door. And to his surprise, this man is delivering this giant, console color TV. Remember the old console TVs that look more like furniture than, than it does a TV? Nowadays, our kids would laugh at the picture they saw on that. But back, in the, back then, it was huge, this, this, this console TV. Uh, and to his surprise, there was a special note that was attached to it. And here's what that note said. It said, thank you so very much for assisting me on the highway the other night. The rain drenched not only my clothes, but it also drenched my spirits. And then you came along. Because of you, I was able to make it to my dying husband's bedside before he passed away. God bless you for helping me and for quietly serving others. Sincerely, Mrs. Nat King Cole. And just, at, just like that man who stopped to help, who nobody was around to see it, just simply, quietly served, just like that, we also need to simply and quietly serve the Lord. Serve, and give, and pray, and read, and just spend time with him to get his attention. We play, we play this game of life to an audience of one. But yet it seems that what the world tells us is that we play this game to the audience of everybody else. That's why we post things on Facebook and Twitter and all those types of things, trying to capture an audience of friends who maybe we don't really know all that well. But really, we have, we have one friend who loves us more than anything. He's willing to leave the 99 in order to reach out to us. We play to an audience of one. Not only publicly, but especially quietly, we play to an audience of one. In Acts chapter 10, Peter sees this vision of this sheet that comes down, and it's full of all this meat that he is really not supposed to eat as a Jewish person. It's really not a part of the tradition of things. And so he wakes up, and here's what happens next in Acts chapter 10, verses 17 and 20. Because while Cornelius is quietly serving and giving and praying, Peter is doing the same. Here's what it says, that while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Peter, who was, or excuse me, Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, nudged him and said, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And you know what Peter does? He quietly obeys. He goes down, invites them in, feeds them, houses them for the night, and then he and a group of others go with them the next day to go see Cornelius. You see, if you want to get God's attention, we need, we need to do it through obedience. Obedience. So that's what our faith is all about. Our faith is all about obedience. It's about obedience, and it's about prayer. And so if you want to get God's attention, obey, obey him. Lastly, Strive to look at people 
through God's eyes. Strive to look at people through God's eyes. If you want God to show up in a big way, if you want God to show up in a big way, this is exactly what we need to do. Make to view people, everyone, through the eyes and through the lens of God, through him. God is always interested in people. I want to, I want to say that again. God is always interested in people. God is interested in you. He's interested in you. I don't care if you've been a believer since you were a three-year-old and now you're 90-some. Or if you just started to become a believer. Or maybe you're just trying to figure out if this is what, if this is the next step for you. God cares for you. He's always thinking about people. He loves people. Everything in Scripture always points to people. It always points to people. Never, never points to group or never points to, to, uh, to a religious uh, activity. It always, he always points to people. And so I want to read a passage of Scripture here because I want you to see what Peter sees coming down out of heaven. If you, uh, Acts chapter 10, in your Bibles, verse 11, just track with me here. It says, he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed uh, animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Get up and kill and eat. Surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And then the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. Okay, so that was the vision. So what does it all mean? What's it all, what, what's he say, what was God saying to the apostle Peter at that time? So let's take a closer look at, uh, at, at all this. Here's what I need you to do. If you've got your Bible and you do this, and I do this all the time. I underline, I highlight, because for me it just makes it easier for me to find things in Scripture. Because I'll go, okay, I know I highlighted that or underlined that somewhere. So I do this. And if, if you are the kind of person that does that, I want to encourage you, this is one to underline or highlight. Underline or highlight the words impure and unclean. There in verse 14. Where Peter says, never, Lord, I've, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. Underline those words. Then, go on to the next verse, verse 15. And I want you to underline, again, the word impure and clean. Now, this is interesting. So here, here's what we're going to do in just the little bit of time we have. We're going to geek out on Greek, okay? So raise your hand if you know Greek, okay? Anybody know Greek in here? Okay, maybe a couple people, all right? So we're going to geek out on Greek. I'm going to try to do this and not make you fall asleep, all right? So here's the thing. The word impure that Peter uses is a Greek word that's called koinos. Uh, koinos means something that's common, uh, something that's, uh, re- that's just uh, uh, regular. It's not holy, uh, but it's just common. Uh, they, the other word, the word for unclean, uh, is the word, uh, uh, I mean, akathop, akathatos. I, I can't even say it. It's, it's tough. It's long. And so here's the difference between those words. Koinos is that which the Jewish men traditionally said is something that's impure. Ah, we don't do that because that's really not right. But the other word, the word unclean, is that which God has said is unclean that God has says we shouldn't worry about touching uh, and so it's it's in God's word so is my mic being a jerk so all right very good so there we go all right so here we go uh, now now I only have one hand to move around so that's not going to be good so anyway so here's here's the thing okay so you still with me okay impure impure is something that's common it's what the Pharisees would say yeah we, we don't we don't do that traditionally we just don't do that the other word, unclean, is what God says, now we definitely don't do that. And so here's what, I want you to, uh, here's what I want you to hear with all of this. For the Pharisees, any, anything that was a tool or utensil uh, that would touch uh, some impure animal or would fall to the dirt, they'd go, oh, no, that's, that's, that's impure. It's common. It's now, now no longer worthy of a holy use. And so we can't, we can't, even, we can't do those things. That's now that's common. And so what the Pharisees viewed as impure, God didn't view as impure. 
but yet the unclean things, that's the thing that God, in, that God considered unclean. So what, you may be going, okay, so what's your point? What are you trying to get at here? Here's, here's what I'm trying to say. In verses 13 and 15, I want us to reread this just real quick, and I want us to go through this. I want you to listen to this. We're going to reread, here we go, with all of this in our brains. The word common uh, and the word unclean. Here's what, here's what Peter says. The voice uh, told him to kill and eat. And uh, Peter says um, in verse 14, Surely not, Lord, I've never eaten anything common. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Then the voice spoke to him and said a second time, Do not call anything common that God has made clean. Notice that God is only concerned about what the Pharisees and their traditions were all about. He he, he knows from his word that he said these things are unclean. Don't Don't do these things. When we think about sinfulness, we know those things because God said, don't do, don't do those things. But, so, but here, God is dealing with the tradition of man, the tradition of man, of, of what the little petty things that God said, don't, don't do these things, that, that the Pharisees said, don't do these things, but God never, never talked about. And so Peter sees this vision, and he goes up into the, up into the air, he wakes up, and, he, and the Spirit nudges him and says, hey, go down and go with these guys tomorrow uh, to go see Cornelius. So he does. So when we get to Acts chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, here's what takes place. Peter does go with, with these Gentiles. He walks into their house, and when he gets there, he sees all these Gentiles all around. All of them are all Gentiles all around. And I want you to hear what happens here. It says, while talking with them, Peter went inside, found a large gathering of people. All Gentile, mind you. Okay, keep that in mind. And he said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or to visit a Gentile. Then he says this, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone, anyone impure or unclean. I shouldn't call anyone common or unclean. His reality, Peter's reality, just collided with his tradition. His reality just collided with his tradition. So what's the point? You may go, okay, Gart, you still haven't got to the point. What's the point in all of this? Here's the point. People are not unredeemable. Hear that. People are not unredeemable. When you look at your neighbor across the street, you go, okay, I know God can work miracles, but really, that guy, I don't think so. Or maybe you may be thinking about the person in your office, your coworker. You go, okay, I know God can work a lot of miracles and can do some amazing things. But really, I would never talk to that person about Christ. There's no way they could, they could be saved. There's no way that they would come to him. Really? Because the Lord says, don't call anything common that he has made clean. That he has made clean. No person is regarded as excluded from an opportunity of salvation. No person is to, is to be despised or disliked. The gospel is, be, is to be preached to all people. The barriers between Jews and Gentiles were tore down when Jesus went to the cross and died for us and then rose again three days later. The barrier between black and white has been tore down at the cross. The barrier between jocks and nerds has been tore down when Jesus went to the cross. Any barrier that we could come up with between people, has been tore down when Jesus went to the cross. We are not to call anyone unredeemable. unredeemable. We're not to call anyone impure or unclean. We are all, we are all saved by grace. Red and yellow, black and white. God sees all of us. We are his children. And when we begin to step outside of whatever tradition we grew up in, whatever tradition that seemed to be around us, or even whatever experiences that we had in the past. When we begin to step outside of that and see people as God sees them, then we can begin to understand that there is no one that is common. God doesn't see you as common. You may see you as common, but God doesn't see you as common. God doesn't see you as, oh, that's, uh, that's just art, you know? That's just Joe. That's just who, that's, you know, just a regular Joe right there. No, you are created separate from everybody else. Yeah, you may have someone that looks like you or you look like somebody else 
on some level, but your fingerprints are all different, right? The way you talk is different. The way you think is different. There's no, no one person like the other one. We are all different, made in God's image. Do not call anyone or anything impure that God has made clean. And for those of you, as we approach this time of communion here in just a little bit, if you think about this, as we come approach time of communion, maybe, maybe for some of you, maybe before you partake, maybe you go and you get it, maybe as you go back to your seat or you go to the altars, maybe for some of you before you partake, it's just asking God to forgive you for looking at other people differently or looking at that guy across the hall or uh, across the street or, or that person you go to school with or that group of people you go to school with differently than everybody else. And how on some level you just see them, if you were really honest with yourself, you kind of see them as unredeemable. Or the fact that they, more than likely, there's only a 1% chance that they'd ever, ever give their life to Christ because they're who they are. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness of those things. And then maybe those are the very people that we need to go up and say, hey, listen, I've got this seat in the right or left of me, and I'm supposed to invite somebody to come, and I'm inviting you. Maybe that's what we need to do. But maybe it's not someone else. Maybe it's not someone else that you have an issue with. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe you see yourself as unredeemable. Maybe you see yourself as someone who, how can God love me? Out of all the things I've done, he knows. He knows what you've done. He, knew, he knows when you've done it. He knows where you've done it. He knows. But I want you to know that he loves you and he cares for you more than anything. And he would still leave the 99 to come to you, no matter who you are, because you are not common. You are not just a regular person. You are loved by God. There is no just regular person. We are all loved by our Father in heaven. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so if you need any more convincing, just know this, because if you hear the voices in your head or you speak to yourself and you say, listen, there's no way that God can do for me what he, I see him doing in Scripture. There's no way that God would love me. I want to tell you something. That message is straight from the pit of hell. It is straight from the pit of hell. And you've got to get rid of that and just follow Christ. Follow him and his word. Because in his word, in his word, look at, look at all of it. He comes specifically for you. Specifically for you. So here in a few minutes, as we take the opportunity, I'm getting ready to pray, and we, I want to encourage you. Uh, you can come up, and you can get the communion. You can take it back to your seat. Uh, you can take it to the altars. If, if uh, uh, you're unable to get up, uh, or you just, you just need the time in your chair, just raise your hand. One of the ushers will come, and they will bring you communion. But let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to meet with God today, to meet with him. Don't walk out of here and squander this opportunity where we have an opportunity to get face-to-face -face with God and begin that process of allowing him to expand our vision of what he wants to do in our life. Because at the end of the day, it's not ever, it's not ever about us. It's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about the person to your right and to your left. It's about the person to your right and to your left. Yeah, we, we're going to spend, we're, we're going to spend time with God. We want to be obedient to him so that nothing can separate us from him because sin separates, right? Our sin, my sin separates me from God, so I need to make sure that I'm not separated from him. But at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about me obeying so that I can reach people around me to my right and to my left. And so for you, as we come and as we partake, be praying for whoever those people are to your right and to your left. I want to encourage you today. If you go to the altars or even in the back, if, if you can't kneel down, I get it. I mean, uh, it's, kinda, it's getting tougher for me to kneel down. But um, if you can't kneel down, there's some tables at the back you just kind of lean on. There are also some prayer cards back there. Maybe, it, maybe you need to be writing down some names of, it could be grandsons or granddaughters. It could be sons and daughters. It could be uh, um, friends, could be neighbors, write their names on that prayer card and drop them in the baskets at the table. We want to know as, as, a, as a church, who do we need to be praying for? We want to pray with you. 
met with a guy this, this Friday, and we just, he, just, he just needed prayer. And so I reached out to the guys around me that I knew were prayer warriors, and I said, hey, I want you to be praying for him. Pray, pray. In fact, this Tuesday, we're going to take a, we're going to take a field trip to where he works, and we're going to pray out in this parking lot for him. Maybe you just need to back up in praying for these folks so that as you approach them and say, hey, it sounds kind of weird, but I don't, would you go to church with me on Sunday? I got a, these two chairs I need to fill, and I was thinking about you. Maybe, maybe as you pray, that you be lifting them up. Uh, and maybe as you pray, write, your, write their names down so we can lift them up as well. Because at the end of the day, it's never about us. It's always about him. That's what the vision is all about. It's always about other people. So don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And if you don't know that God has made you clean, you don't have to look any further than the cross. You don't have to look any further than those emblems of his bread and, his, and the blood that was poured out for us at the cross. We don't have to look any further than that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you love us and care for us enough, Lord God. Lord, that when we honestly, truly seek you with all of our heart, you will be found by us. When we say, when we say, come to me, you are willing to come and meet with us. Father, I pray that today, Lord, as we come to you, whether it's at the altars or at our chairs, Lord, that as we come, you would meet with us, Lord God. Father, I pray that you begin to put people in our hearts that we need to reach for you. Lord, that we put people on, that you would put people on our hearts that need to know you, Lord God, that we need to be praying for, that we need to be talking to, and that we need to be inviting so they will know the gospel message because it's not about us. It's always, always about what you have in store for those around us, Father. Lord, you've called us to reach people, and so we ask you to help us to do that, Lord God. Lord, as we partake today, we give you thanks, and we give you praise, and we give you glory for your sacrifice. Lord, meet with us as we desire to meet with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
all your troubles. Lay all your troubles and all your worries and cares at my feet. Then you'll rest, rest in. Scripture says, uh, Lord tells Moses that you'll have rest in my presence. And so this week, don't walk out, don't walk away without remembering the fact that we need to be in his presence every week. Uh, and I encourage you, if you need someone to pray with you, because I get it, it's, it's a tough world out there, it's rough. Uh, we've got some people over here to my left and to my right, uh, Donna and Jim. Uh, they'll be up here, and if you just need someone to pray with you, uh, they're not muscle, I promise you. Uh, they're just here to uh, pray. Uh, and if you want to know, what are my next steps to receive Christ? What does that look like for me, wherever you're at? Maybe, it's, maybe if you, wanna, uh, you haven't placed your membership here at MC3 yet, uh, you can come see me or you can come see them. They'll help you through the next steps on what that looks like for you. But don't walk away without spending that time with God uh, and without uh, being encouraged to do that this week. And I want to encourage you, like I always say, uh, when you're at the Connections Counter, because you're going to go right by it, okay? Pick up one of these bookmarks if you haven't already. If you don't already have a plan for how you read God's Word, let me encourage you to dive into it and let Him teach you and let Him spend time with you this week as you do that. So don't forget to grab one of those on your way out. There's also a cheat sheet to help you with our soap method that we do. Uh, so we make it super simple because I'm a simple-minded guy and I need that kind of help. Uh, and so I figure maybe you might need that kind of help as well. I'm going to close this out in prayer. And uh, we just thank you so much for being here today. Uh, it's been a, it's an awesome day. And we're glad that you have, have been with us and have worshiped the Lord today. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Lord, you are great and mighty and awesome. We thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would, you would even dream about expanding our dreams and our visions, Lord God, of what you want to do in our life. Lord, you, stu- you want to use us from the time we are believers until we go home to be with you. You are always wanting to use us in ministry, Father God. Help us, Lord God, to always recognize that we are here to reach others, that we should strive to see other people through your eyes, Lord God, and that no one, not even ourselves, are un redeemable. And so, Father God, bless us as we leave out of here. Use us in a mighty way to reach that one, to fill the seat to our right and to our left. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank mm-hmm. you.